morning, church. Just want to make sure that you saw that. There was an NCC choir sign up. That, that, hey, that's something new. That's something new, and that's on Pastor Jenny's heart. And if you haven't noticed, Pastor Jenny's not been here for a while, and she has been on staff for seven years, and we've granted her a sabbatical. She's been gone for a few weeks. She's got one more week. And I'm excited to have her back refreshed, recharged, strong, and on fire with a choir. On fire with a choir. That's going to be awesome. I am excited about baptisms today. I've been excited because we had new members class this morning. And we have a potluck after service. A lot going on. Yeah, every, every time I mention food, people get fired up. It's like Jesus and food. Woo, woo. Well, you know, today reminds me so much of Acts chapter 2, of, of verses 41 and 42, where, where the new church, the brand new church, is being added to. There's baptisms, there's fellowshipping, there's eating together, there's praying together. And the church grows, and the church strengthens, and the church is alive. And you see that today in just a matter of three or four hours. It's all condensed, happening today. But I'm also mindful that I feel like when we were worshiping, heaven was almost coming down and touching earth. Yeah. And that was a shift for many of you before you came in here. You were full of the world. I was full of the world. The earth was all that was before me. And then as I came into God's presence and was reminded, He's always present with me. I'm carrying the fire. You're carrying the fire. You're carrying His Spirit. That the world shouldn't dominate my thoughts and my feelings and my actions. And I believe that, that God's just, He's compelling me to ask us just to pray for a moment before Hannah comes up and brings the fiery word that God has given you. Because I believe that there's a heaviness right now. There's a global heaviness. Yes. The media is throwing things at you that's so contrary to the kingdom of God. Yes. The media has your attention in the Olympics, so they'll throw things at you that's contrary to God's world and God's ways and the heaven that is coming on earth. The media has your attention in American politics and you're... The church is either complacent or fired up and angry. There's these things that are like almost out of reach for us to do anything about. But God is in control. God is sovereign. God sees it all. And God is sending His Son back. He's coming back. He's coming back. But in the meantime, we don't stay silent. In the meantime, bring it back down to your level. You've got bills to pay. You, you, got, you got health issues. You, you got family constraints. You, you got concerns with things at work, things in your job, things with your family. And you can do something about these things. That's right. The global things and the personal things. And so I, I believe we need to press into prayer for just a moment because there are even people's lives at stake in this very moment that are part of this church. That's right. Maybe somebody in here, you feel like your life's at stake, maybe mentally, emotionally. But maybe somebody's fighting for their life right now, physically. Maybe somebody, and we've prayed before at this moment, somebody needed rescuing. Somebody is facing a trafficking issue. And this church has stopped to pray, believing that God Almighty would intervene, rescue, save, and redeem the whole situation. I'm asking us to pray right now. We're just going to shift off the script and pray for just a moment. And I'm believing united in prayer is one of the greatest, most powerful things that we can do in this day and time. So I call you saints to pray with me. God in heaven, Father in heaven, 
May you not seem so far away right now. God, we, we sensed your presence as we were worshiping and we were, we were praying and, and we knew that you were near and we know that you're near now and you're always with us, God. You've given us your spirit and you've given us a fire and you've also given us compassion and love and we carry the peace in addition to the fire. Let us be a lamb, but let us be a lion. God, you have, you have sent your son before us to show us how to go about living in this life, in this world, God. And may today we be very visible. May we be very seen. May we be very aware of the brokenness in our world, God. Right now, I lift up anybody that's in a hospital bed right now, that's fighting for their life, that's part of our church family, God. We intercede for them. God, do your resurrection work in those situations. God, I lift up anybody that's tormented mentally, that's, that's frustrated with depression and anxiety and confusion, God. Bring peace. Bring your peace. And God, I lift up those that are within reach of coming into the kingdom that don't know your son, God. I pray that the barriers are broken today, that the relationship between you and them is made whole. By faith that someone receive you, someone receive your son Jesus as their Lord and Savior personally today, God. This is a body that's believing right now in unity. You say that when two or three are gathered together, you hear our prayers, you answer our prayers. We're praying, seeking, knocking, and we're asking for the things on our heart, God, to be answered in your way and in your time. And God, right now, whether it's it's... Whether it's a, it's a message of confusion and distortion and evil that's penetrating this culture. And we as a church, and we as the part of the greater church, stand still and watch. God, may we rise up as an army of, of believers that, that pray and act and we share the good news of Jesus and the kingdom that's coming rises up over top of this, this evil and, and, and this darkness that tries to make headway, God. God, may the growth of the church begin now in a great way. May we have revival. May it start with us. May it begin right here in New Covenant Church in Clyde in Haywood County. God, revive us to realize that we don't have to succumb because we have overcome. God, God, give us the fire that we need. God, give us the compassion for souls that we need. And God, I pray for death to come to life. I pray for, I pray for those things that we feel like are just too far gone, that you would pull them back into a position of a great testimony of the power and strength and love. That is all yours. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Your prayers are heard. Your prayers are powerful. They are the incense. They are the sweet aroma that lifts. And they're all heard and they're all answered. Now I believe we're called to be a praying church. And we're to continue to pray. And I pray for this woman greatly. This is a this woman that's going to bring the word to you today. Hannah Menikoff is an important person in this church, an important person in my life. She's a friend of the house, a friend of mine. Her husband Clint is an elder here. We pray for his safe return as he's traveling today. And um, I pray that your ears are open, church. I ask that your ears be wide open and that you receive all that's meant for you and for us together. In Jesus' name, come on up, Hannah. Would you stand in honor of Hannah? Thank you. Hello and good morning again. Everybody's been saying good morning, so I feel like I need to say good morning. Has anyone had to check the date every single day just because time is spinning so fast that you can't keep up what day it is. It's August the 4th. That just seems impossible. It's been three months 
since I spoke with you last, and it doesn't feel that way. However, it is always an honor to be with church family on Sunday mornings, and it is a nervous privilege that I get to speak with you that I take very, very seriously. So thank you for being here today. If you are new here this morning or a regular, I want to do a brief recap. We've not been in a sermon series because of the summertime, which allows us to take sabbaticals and vacations and trips. And so I'm so thankful that we belong to a church that honors rest because when they rest, it blesses the whole body. But more importantly than that, it gives us the space to honor our local missions in our community. And one of our very own foreign missionaries, Abigail Christopher, if anyone was here when she got to speak. And it also gives us space to do what we call NCC Summer, which allows the speaking team to share whatever has been stirring in their hearts. But I am a person of structure, so <laughs> we're going to stay in the, the mission field lines. I'm going to tie a bow on missions for us today. And then some people are going to come over here and jump in this pool. <laughs> and then we're going to walk to the end of the hall for a cookout, so it's the best of both worlds. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, I want to share something that I saw this morning when I was praying for the service today. Did anybody in here raise a picky eater? Cooper, if you're watching. <laughs> that can be a challenge. And the mission trips that I've been a part of, I was always taught that it was a dishonor, almost a disgrace, to not eat what was being served. If you, if you liked it or if you didn't like it. And in some places, if you didn't even know what it was, you still had to eat it. Um, God showed me that we were, the church body here was just all sitting at this large family table. And we were being served wine from the worship team. And then God's message began to fill our plates. And then I could smell something baking as the altar ministers were laying their hands on those in need as if they were serving dessert. And we were all gathered in joy like a happy family. No one was fighting at the table. No one was grumbling about what was being served. Nobody was complaining and sending their food back. It was a beautiful image of God's heart for his family. So I want to pray before we get started over our appetites this morning, because this is a heavy topic, and it's a plateful with a lot of instruction through Scripture that I'm slightly nervous about delivering, not because it's truth, but because I want it to be as clear in your ears as it is in my spirit. And sometimes that can be a challenge of, I know what I want to say, but how you hear it sometimes doesn't happen that way. And so would you just join with me since we're a house of prayer and just join with me in prayer this morning and let's just pray over this word. Father, I just ask God that you give us kingdom appetites. God, that you would cause us to be so hungry and thirsty for righteousness, that we are ravenous for your presence, that we are ravenous for your word, the bread of life. God, would you just send your truth and let that aroma cause such a hunger on the inside of us that that's all we chase. Father, just... We love you so much, and we just thank you that your word is bread to us, that it is life to us. So come, and we welcome you to come and feed us to the full. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see 
and a heart to receive everything that you want us to hear today. That we would, that we would leave here changed. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Thank you. How many of you have done local or foreign missions in the room? Several people. So you have kind of a clear understanding of what that typical mission trip entails. You've got your construction crews, you've got your medical teams, you've got your praying people, and then collectively, sometime during those two weeks, you all go to a local orphanage and you feed the kids, you play with them, maybe take them out on an outing. And those mission trips are important and can be life changing for the believer. I believe that we should have a believer's boot camp. And every time somebody got saved and they reached a certain age, that it was a requirement that they had to go on a local mission trip and a foreign mission trip, kind of like driver's ed. Uh, <laughs> but there are some of us in this room that are on the mission field 24-7 through Marketplace, which simply means that where you work on a daily basis is a mission field. And that could look like the, the medical staff. It could look like selling women their clothes. <laughs> it could, it's definitely our pastors. It could be those of us that work in addiction recovery or those of us that have been called to the homeless population. That is a 24 seven mission field. And indicator number one that your job is a mission field is you want more for people than they know how to want for themselves. Okay, <laughs> and it, we learn and we, we know that that's the way we feel about them because we're seeing through the eyes of our heart and not the eyes of our head. And we learn the importance of this in Ephesians chapter one. If you'll go there with me, we're gonna read in verses 17 and 18. And Paul is praying for us saying this, that the God of our Lord Jesus, the Father of glory, would have given you a spirit of wisdom and revelation for your knowledge of him, that the eyes of your heart have been enlightened for you to have known what the hope of his inheritance, the riches of his glory, and the inheritance for his saints are. Paul is praying and asking God to give us wisdom of who God is. And through our understanding of that, that our eyes, the heart of our eyes would be opened to the hope he has for all of his people, the inheritance he has for all of us, the riches that he has for all of us. And in verse 19, he explains that this is impossible in our natural strength. So if we are helping someone, or more importantly, ourselves, in our strength, we are seeing them or ourselves through our head's eyes, our natural eyes. And also that means we're seeing their situation or our situation through eyes that are filtered with our fears, our judgments, Amen. our impatience, our criticisms, our insecurities, and we all, that's not meant to be a guilt statement. It's just we need to recognize when we move from here to here and we need to adjust. That's just faith. Learning when we are walking by the flesh versus when we are walking by the spirit. Okay? Let's see where we are. So whether God gives us clear instructions in this book about how he feels about missions. We have a clear statement of seek mercy, find justice, plead the cause of the fatherless, heal the brokenhearted, give sight to the blind, lead them out of darkness. And those are just a few examples of God's heart and how he feels towards those that can't yet care for themselves. And we are well-versed 
in the instructions for missions that Jesus left us with in Matthew 28, which is heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, and go make disciples of all nations. So whether we are called to foreign soil or local soil, we, ha we clearly have a big mission statement to fulfill for them. And learning how to see through the eyes of our heart and through our understanding of who God is and what all he has for his people is one of the biggest ways that we will successfully fulfill that mission statement for them. Would you agree? I think that we're doing a fantastic job in some of that. I heard just recently that there was a widow actually in this church that called and said, you can take me off the widow list because my neighbor is taking such good care of me that the church can spend more time taking care of someone less fortunate than her. Y'all, that's the book of Acts happening right here in this house. And so don't think for one moment that the Spirit of God is not going to be poured out on a stronger measure as we become more pure and more holy before him in taking care of his brokenhearted. Amen. But how do, we, how do we become more pure and holy without confusing the simplicity of the gospel to, come more, to become more Christ-like and turning his truths into more works and more performance. Well, we find a couple of ways listed in James chapter 1. And some of the readings that you see up here on the screen may be different from the version, slightly different from the version that I'm reading, but just, just listen to the words. If someone thinks he is religious, but is not restraining his tongue, he is deceiving his heart, and this religion is useless. Religion pure and undefiled, which is translated holy, before God and Father is this, to care for the orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself spotless from the world. Like I said, I think we're doing a fantastic job taking care of our widows and our single moms. We're buying school supplies, just like we did last weekend, providing those school supplies for those kids. We're buying for kids at Christmas. But we've missed the biggest one in need, and that's ourselves. It said, learn to restrain your tongue and to keep yourself spotless from the world. Let's just read it one more time. If someone thinks he is religious, now in the original Aramaic, that word religious would have been translated true ministers. So if someone thinks he is a true minister, we all know we're called to be ministers. We're a royal priesthood. Every one of us in the room that are believers are called to minister the gospel. So if someone thinks he is a true minister, but is not restraining his tongue, he is deceiving his heart, and this ministry is useless. Ministry pure and undefiled before God and Father is this, to care for the orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself spotless from the world. So what are some spots in our world today? Just throw some out there. Okay. What else? Judgment. Judgment. Prejudice. Pride. Pride. Hate. Jealousy. Unworthiness. What about anxiety? Depression. And suicide. And all the injustices that we hear and see about. Is the church free from those spots? I'm not yet. Heidi Baker, Lave Hetland, and Bill Johnson all agree that the world's biggest problem 
is the orphan spirit. And if the body of Christ as individuals could get healed of that, we would definitely change the world. Our tongues would be restrained. Our hearts would not be deceived. And all of our ministry would be useful and pure and holy before the Lord. Therefore, the title of this message is The Orphan Within, The Mission Field of Self-Soil. Just a light topic before lunch. <laughs> Why do these Christian leaders believe that the orphan spirit is the biggest problem in the world? Well, first of all, because they, they are called to the orphan and the abandoned. And on a daily basis, they see the struggles inside those children's lives emotionally, physically, spiritually, and behaviorally. Secondly, they go into the church to teach adult believers who have not been abandoned or orphaned, and they spot the same struggles. So they have an understanding that what's true in the natural is also a true reflection of what's going on in the spirit. Because no matter where they've been all around the world, because they, they work everywhere, Africa, the Middle East, I mean, every country, they are in it, including the U.S., and they have come to the conclusion that no matter where they are, it's all the same. It's the same struggles. It's the same spiritual battles. And so their conclusions for these characteristics, whether legitimate or spiritual, sound like this. Feeling abandoned, of course rejected, a hard time connecting with God and or people, performance driven, workaholics, ashamed to ask for good things. They feel empty and needy, they're jealous, fear of failure, either codependent or independent, they protect or withdrawal, feel like they have to earn love and acceptance, they're competitive, they compare, they're controlling, and that's just to name a few. So I don't say this with any type of judgment or harshness because I know what God has done in my heart the last three months as I've been studying this topic. I say this with overwhelming compassion. Welcome to the body of Christ. Because here's what those character traits look like inside these families. Competing against each other, unworthiness. Comparing ourselves to each other, unworthiness, jealous of why them, not me. Why did the prophet call them out? Not me. Why did they get asked to do that? Not me. Unworthiness. Here's a big one. Turning others' obedience to God into rejection towards ourselves. Unworthiness. Misplaced loyalties. Fear of man. Staying places too long when you know God has told you not to. Fear of man. Calls you to be completely disobedient to the Lord. No boundaries. Having a problem when others have boundaries. Fear of man. Unworthiness. 
working and performing to be accepted and chosen. Manipulation. And that's a sneaky one. Because we have to be very careful to not take our loved one's issues and pain into our own hands and not let God do what he needs to do inside of them. Our intentions on all of this can be right and we can still be very wrong (laughs) spiritually. Complaining, gossiping, grumbling against each other and becoming offended. I mean, it's just yuck, yuck, yuck. But the list is a mile long. The bottom line is, is we are called to be a family of brothers and sisters that are loving and supporting one another. Pleasing our Heavenly Father. I'm just reminded, like I just see that image of that large family table just flashing before my, before my face. With no, no children were arguing at the table. You know, we have, that, we have that experience inside of our own homes. We know what that feels like. There's nothing worse for a parent than to have your adult children at odds with one another. Isn't that terrible feeling? And you can't have everyone over to eat at the same time. And so I'm just asking that we consider those things and how our Father in heaven feels when we're grumbling and complaining and sending our food back. So I have to tend to agree with Lave that we have a, we have a problem. We have, we have a orphan spirit problem. He also has said that Lave in particular during my studies of all of this caught my attention more than, than the others per se, because he has ministered healing to the orphan spirit all over the world, in particular the Middle East. And he has said these things right here that there's 37 million churches in the world which he refers to as orphanages but I will not do that full of orphans and they are all in a love deficit and when you are in a love deficit you chase passions, anything to make yourself feel better. When you are in a value deficit, you chase positions. So it would be anything that made you feel valuable and like you had a purpose. I need that job, claw your way to the top, whatever that looks like. When you have a security deficit, you chase possessions. I need the second home, I need the car, I'll be happy when. And you chase all of these things. And every bit of that is tied to a broken identity. In my line of work, I and with much experience, I know that pain always pursues pleasure through drugs, alcohol, pornography, affairs. And I sit and I watch inside families, broken people produce broken people. And it's no different inside of these families and the church globally Because if we are broken up here, we produce broken down here, right? And so it's important for us 
to know what's going on the inside of the soil of our heart, the soil of our mind, so that we can be as healthy as we possibly can, raising up people to be healthy. And New Covenant, I, I can stand here and say this with complete transparency, New Covenant Church honors inner healing ministry. It is very, very important to this house. And our inner healing ministry has taken a hit in the last three years. But they are building a mission team, a construction crew, a medical crew, a praying crew, a feeding crew. They are rebuilding because it's just like the song sang this morning that the gates of hell will not prevail. Amen. So when you have a ministry in the house that's important, as important as inner healing, of course it's going to take a hit because Satan always asks to sift things like wheat. So we shouldn't be surprised. We don't have to be upset or offended at the fact that our inner healing teams have, been, have taken a hit and that we're having to come in and build again. That's okay. It's just part of it. But I know that I can stand here and say, I promise you that they are working behind the scenes to get that ministry up and running. And not just for the people in this house, but for anybody that needs it. Because that's how important inner healing is here to this house. Whew, that was a lot. Is everybody doing okay? <laughs> Okay, so we're going to look at three ways that we can start to correct this issue inside of our heart. Not the only three ways, but just three ways that God has laid out for us today. So number one, there's a lot of scripture to read. There's a lot of instructions, so just hang in there with me. So my point number one is pick up a new identity. We're going to find that in Ephesians chapter one, starting at verse th three. And I'm going to take a drink of water before I start reading this. <clears throat> okay. Chapter one, verse three. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm has already been lavished upon you as a loved gift from our wonderful Heavenly Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus, all because he sees us wrapped into Christ. This is why we celebrate him with all of our hearts. And in love, he chose us before he laid the foundation of the universe. Because of his great love, he ordained us so that we would be seen as holy in his eyes with an unstained innocence. For it was always his perfect plan to adopt us as his delightful children. Through our union with Jesus, the anointed one, so that his tremendous love that cascades over us would glorify his grace. For the same love he has for the beloved Jesus, he has for us. And this unfolding plan brings him great pleasure. I love that part. Since we are now joined to Christ, we have been given treasures of redemption by his blood. The total cancellation of our sins. All because the cascading riches of his grace. This super abundant grace is already powerfully working in us. Releasing all forms of wisdom and practical understanding. And through, this, through the revelation of the anointed one, he unveiled his secret desires to us. The hidden mystery of his long range plan, which he was delighted to implement from the very beginning of time. And because of God's unfailing purpose, this detailed plan will reign supreme through every period of time until the fulfillment of all ages finally reaches its climax when God makes all things new in all of heaven and earth through Jesus Christ. 
Through our union with Christ, we too have been claimed by God as his own inheritance. Before we were ever born, he gave us our destiny, that we would fulfill the plan of God who always accomplishes every purpose and every plan in his heart. Wow, what a love letter. What a statement. That is a, such a rich promise from God the Father to his adopted, delightful children that he takes great pleasure in us knowing him the way that he desires for us to know him, that he gave us a destiny before we were ever even born. I mean, that is a powerful, powerful statement. And I bet 100% that if we were standing in front of an attorney reading the will of our parents, we would understand word for word, line upon line of exactly what that will was telling us that our parents had to say to us, what they were leaving us, and exactly what was going to have to be divided between our siblings. And so my suggestion, is is that we go back and we read Ephesians chapter 1 over and over in every version until it is burned into the memory of ourselves and that we know what he says because this in Ephesians 1 is our blood covenant and it's our inheritance that does not have to be divided between our brothers and sisters. It's all ours. Every bit of it's ours. And it's up to us to know it to believe it, to behave it, or, or we're never going to utilize it. We're never going to pick it up. We're never going to pick up a new identity if we don't understand what he is telling us, who we are, what we have, and what we can do. So point number one is we've got to pick up a new identity. Okay, point number two and that is remove the yoke. We're going to find that in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And I'm going to start at verse 14. You must not ever become unequally yoked with unbelievers. For would some mix righteousness and iniquity, or some fellowship and light with darkness, but what agreement is there of Messiah and Blair, which that is Jesus and Satan? Or what has the believer in common with an unbeliever? And what agreement can anyone have with idols in a sanctuary of God? For we are a sanctuary of the living God. Just as God said, I shall dwell and I shall walk among them. I shall be their God, and they will be my people. On this account, you must immediately come out from the midst of them, and you must be separated from them at once, says the Lord. And you must not ever touch the unclean. Then I shall take you in, and I shall be a father to you, and you will be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord of hosts. So since we have these promises, beloved. We should cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, bringing about holiness in reverent fear of God. This word is Jesus Christ. The word says that Jesus is the word. These words are our Lord and Savior. These words are alive, they are active, they are powerful, they are sharp, they are called to be a sword, they are called to be a mirror to our mind and bring down arguments that are opposing to the purposes of God. It is designed to be a sword and a mirror that looks inside of our heart and discerns our motives and our intentions and it casts those things down and it changes us down to the cellular level. It says that it cuts bone and marrow and joint. It divides. But if we're not reading it, sometimes in the right way, we will miss 
what it is saying. And there are, imp- there are things in here that we need to read very literal. And we need to understand it's black and white. It gives us instruction. But there are times that we need to read this word in a figurative way so that it can go into a spiritual part of who we are and do surgery and do what it's designed to do. And so when Paul is talking to the Corinthians, he's telling them, don't get married to a non-believer. Don't mix your business relationships with people that don't believe like you, that don't have the same morals, the same values. And in a literal sense, we understand what he's saying. Some of us have experience of doing the very thing he told us not to do. And we, we know what happens when you're not equally yoked. It prevents unity. It prevents unity in your home. It prevents unity in your life. It prevents unity in your business. And so we understand that you don't mix dark and light. We understand what he's saying when he says, you wouldn't bring in a bunch of idols and line them up on this altar for people to come and worship while we were standing in here worshiping the one true God. We wouldn't do that. So we understand what he's saying, but let's look at it on a deeper level. Let's take it in and let it cut our hearts because I can read God's truth and believe Satan's lie. And in verse 16, it told me I was the sanctuary of the living God. Well, I'm yoked up with an unbeliever because I've got some insecurities. I've got some doubts. I've got some anxiety. I've got some fear of man. I've got all kinds of stuff that is opposing to this word. And so I am yoked up with an unbeliever. I am yoked up with some darkness in a sanctuary of light. So we have got to come out from underneath that bondage, that yoke, that unbeliever, that lie we believe. We've got to divorce some things, no matter how cute they are. Right? I mean, we've got to get some of that out of our hearts and out of our minds. So point number one, we've got to pick up a new identity and know what the will and testament of our father left us as an inheritance. And we've got to come out of relationship with that unbeliever. Okay, point number three, kick out the liar. (laughs) And that's going to be found in Galatians chapter four. Okay. Anybody who follows Damon Thompson, that would be I, knows that he taught on Galatians chapter four for an entire year. So I'm not stealing any of his information if you know who he is. (laughs) Let me illustrate, as long as there's an heir, he is a minor. He is not really much different than a servant, although he's master over all of them. For until the appointed time by the father, the child is under the domestic supervision of the guardians of this state. I just want to pause right there before I read on. Go back to the example of us standing in front of an attorney listening to them read the will of our parents. They would never read the will to a child that could not understand what was being said. They would hold, they would put that will and that inheritance into some hands, some guardianship hands until that child was old enough, became an adult to understand what was getting left to them. That's, that's what he's saying. So, We're an heir, but until we understand what is rightfully ours, we're a minor and we're no different than a servant. Even though 
We're master over all of it, and we don't understand that. So that's why it's so important to pick up a new identity, because there's things we can do that we don't know we can do yet. And we've been given the authority to do them. Okay, let's read on. So it is with us that when we were juveniles, we were enslaved under the hostile spirits of the world. But when the time of fulfillment had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, under the law. Yet all of this was so that he would redeem and set free those held hostage to the law so that we would receive our freedom and full legal adoption as his children. And so that we would know that we are his true children, God released the spirit of sonship into our hearts, moving us to cry out immediately, my father, my true father, tell me you don't want to go back to living strictly by the law. Haven't you ever heard or haven't you ever listened to what the law really says? Now, I'm going to pause right there before I go on because I want to make a point. When, when we're yoked up with all of that stuff that we were talking about, we put rules on ourselves. Do you know that there's 613 rules in the Old Testament that bring death? And Jesus is saying that I died to bring you out from underneath the bondage of all of that so that you can walk in the freedom of who I died to create you to be. But when we are not walking in our right identity, when we are yoked up with with an unbeliever, when we are yoked up with darkness, there's a lot of rules on us. The fear of man, unworthiness, all of these actions, all, all of these beliefs, sorry, all of these beliefs that are going on on the inside of us cause us to behave in ways that expose the orphan within. That's why those people can spot those familiar characteristics inside church people. And that shouldn't be because Jesus Christ went to the cross so that we would be free of all of that junk. And it is only up to us to divorce those lies, to divorce that shame, to get rid of that guilt, to get rid of that unworthiness or whatever it is. And we have to do that. It's a process. It's just like Pastor said last week. It's a long road to get some of your prayers answered. But it's worth it. Sometimes they happen fast. Sometimes they don't. But we're called for to the end of the race. <laughs> we're called to the end of the race. Okay, I'm going to go on. Have you forgotten that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave girl, and the other by the free woman. Ishmael, the son of the slave girl, was born of the natural realm. But Isaac, the son of the free woman, was born supernaturally by the Spirit, a child of the promise of God. These two women and their sons express an allegory, and because and become symbols of two covenants. The first covenant was born on Mount Sinai, birthing children into slavery, children born to Hagar, for Hagar represents the law given at Mount Sinai in Arabia. The Hagar metaphor corresponds to the earthly Jerusalem of today who are, still, who are currently still in bondage. In contrast, therefore, there is a heavenly Jerusalem above us, which is our true mother. That would be Sarah. She is the free woman, birthing children into freedom. Dear friends, just like Isaac, we are now the true children who inherit the kingdom promises. And just as the son of the natural world at that time harassed the son born of the power of the Holy Spirit 
so it is today. And what does scripture tell us to do? Expel the slave mother and her son. The son of the slave woman will not inherit will not be a true heir. Some scriptures may say, expel the slave, the maid and her son. Her son will not inherit with my son. For the true heir of the promises is the son of the free woman. It's now so obvious we're not the children of the slave woman. We are the supernatural sons of the free woman, sons of grace. Jesus set us free for the freedom of legalism. So you must stand firm and not be subject to a yoke of bondage again. Now, Paul is taking a literal story from the Old Testament and using it in a figurative way for us. And we all know that story of Ishmael and Isaac the older half-brother, how he bullied and harassed and taunted his younger brother, Isaac. And Sarah stood back and watched it for a moment and was like, oh no, kick her out. Because her and her son are not going to inherit with my son. I'm not putting up with this. And so it's no different for us today that we have an orphan living on the inside of us that's harassing us, that's picking on us, that's telling us lies, that's causing us to behave in ways that are not justified in the kingdom of God. And we have a, we have a mandate, expel her, kick her and her son out Amen. of the inside of you and pick up the son of an heir that you are, the daughter of the heir that you are, we belong to a king. The king of kings Amen. and the Lord of lords. That is, our father in that is our father in heaven and our inheritance is great. But we have to pick up a new identity. We have to remove the yoke of bondage. We have to expel the orphan Amen. within. Amen. Amen. It's not little orphan Annie. She's not nice. It's kind of the three stepsisters on Cinderella. I mean, she, they're hating on you. And for guys, it may be the three bullies following you home after school. And you know what happens if you turn around and throat punch them or wear them out, it stops. All of it stops. So what's true in the natural is also true in the spirit. And we've got to turn around and fight back. We've got to turn around and say, no, you are terminated. You will no longer be in this sanctuary. You are evicted at this moment right now. And we've got to take authority over those lies that are causing us to behave in ways that are opposing what this right here tells us we have and who we are. And I just want to close with this story. In one of Lave's books, he talks about a conference that he did somewhere in the Middle East, and there was a Muslim woman who got saved. And after the conference was over, she came up to him and she said, how long have you known about this Jesus? And he said, well, I've been saved for, you know, however many years. And she said, no, how long has your people known about this Jesus? And he said, for thousands of years. And she fell down. And she began to cry. And she said, if you've known about this Jesus for that long, then why didn't you come sooner? My husband 
did not know this Jesus and he is dead. And my son did not know this Jesus and he is dead. Why did you wait so long to come and tell me about this Jesus? And she was able to receive her salvation that day. But I'm here to tell you that we need to be saved from the world, from the yoke, from the maid and her son. And Jesus has come to set us free from a broken identity, from being yoked up with an unbeliever, and for letting an orphan bully us around on the inside of who we are. He has come. And he is helping us to get free through his word, not mine, his. And so I just ask that the altar ministers would go ahead and come forward. And I'm going to pray. And if you are struggling in any of these areas, just come forth and let them lay their hands on you. And so, Father, we just thank you that your word cuts and divides. We thank you that it is your great pleasure for us to be your your children. It is your, it is your great pleasure and it is your great plan for us to receive the full inheritance that you have for us through the blood and the resurrection of our Savior. We thank you, God, for your truths and how you're helping us and how you're setting us free and how you're raising a standard on the inside of who we are. You're calling us to a greater walk. You're calling us to a greater calling. And our greatest calling, oh God, is to know you. Our greatest purpose is to know you, oh God. Our greatest anointing is to know you. That's, that's first. And so we thank you, Father. And we love you. And if there's anybody else in the room that doesn't even feel comfortable coming up for a prayer, you raise your hand and I'll come running straight to you. Lord, we pray over these baptisms that are fixing to happen, that they will go in that water and come out new, that they will not be yoked up with the lies and the anxiety and the depression of the world, but that they will walk in the fullness of of their identity in Jesus name that this house will walk in the fullness in the fullness of the of your identity I declare today that you will walk in the fullness of your identity that Jesus Christ died to give you I declare that you are not married to an unbeliever that there is not darkness in the light of your sanctuary but it is full of the living God that it is full of the living God. And I declare that over you, that your mind be renewed, that your heart be guarded, that you be free, that your feet be anointed to run and minister the gospel to everybody that you meet. That God is setting this place free, that we are different. We're different because we believe. We believe what he said. We believe and it's counted to us as righteousness. And that's my declaration over you today. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, amen.